Number two, George Council loved the church. He loved the church. He loved its every manifestation. He loved the vestments. He loved the sacraments and the sacred spaces. He loved them because he believed and experienced them to be vehicles, channels of God's grace. He loved the people he served in L.A., in western Massachusetts, here in Lake Forest. And when the Diocese of New Jersey was in need of healing, when it appealed in its profile for a person of prayer who lives the faith, one who is a peacemaker and a spiritual diplomat, George answered the call. And they got the bishop they needed. He loved to make his declaration of love of the church in Spanish. Do you remember? Me encanta la iglesia. See? I love the church. Me encanta la iglesia. The church enchants me. It's a line that he picked up from a woman at the fledgling startup at Nuestra Señora, which was, of course, a special mission of this parish dear to his heart and one of which he was a central supporter. He once wrote about the church, I haven't got all the answers and I am not a good Christian, but by grace I have decided to follow Jesus and to join in kingdom building with other disciples in the fellowship of Christ's church. The man's love for Jesus and for the church and for her people was prodigious. And always there were people to love. He loved to read. He loved baseball. He loved music. He loved the church. And supremely, beyond all else, George loved Ruth. And the families from which they came and the family they created. Here during the Lake Forest years, we all heard about Sarah's studies in China, later her organizing work in the Chinese community here in Chicago. And in, early in those years, we watched how he would um, so eagerly look forward to and then head off on the father-daughter drive with Martha to and from Oberlin. He cherished those trips. The girls' accomplishments, but more importantly, the manifestly good people that they grew to be, nothing made George more proud or happy. And as the girls' own families grew, the circle of his love just grew with them. George and Ruth, you know, were college sweethearts. And it has always struck me that there was something about that youthful sweetness and delight that continued to characterize their love for each other for 47 years of marriage. George rejoiced at Ruth's artistic gift and the ways she found to share that gift, but the greatest gift for George was Ruthie herself. And he loved her, and she returned that love with quiet abundance. And that she forgave the church for its demands upon her beloved is one more gift to be acknowledged. Nobody but Ruth knows the complete cost of George's struggle with Parkinson's in this past decade, and especially in the last couple of years. Both of them faced into it with characteristic grace and strength. To the initial diagnosis, George responded by, what else? Heading off to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, and later Machu Picchu with his favorite deacon, Dan Fowler. You might say George responded to his disease 
with that same chumbawamba theology. I get knocked down, but I get up again, and you're never going to keep me down. Ruth says that the physical manifestations which others noticed were really not the hardest part. The hardest part, of course, was the cognitive diminishment. Yet even that was met with familiar sweetness and humor. At one point, Ruth relates, she sent him to the grocery store for eggplant. He returned home with chocolate cake. (laughs) And more recently, he came back from the grocery, Ruth says, inexplicably, with eight packages of Hebrew national hot dogs. (laughs) When Ruth gently wondered what he was thinking, he replied, oh, well, It's for all my friends. There do not exist enough hot dogs for all George's friends. So Ruth pointed out that he forgot the buns. And the next day, George made another trip to the store and returned with a few dozen hamburger buns. Thus it was that in the week after his death, his family had a picnic to enjoy George's hot dogs, a Eucharistic feast, if ever there was one. It is said that in old age or in illness, we are apt to become more of whatever we are, right? So in his illness, George was prone to become more gentle, more kind, more humble, more sweet, more patient, more faithful. So, last week at George's funeral in New Jersey, I had the opportunity to share with that cathedral full of people most of these same recollections that I've been sharing with you. I had been asked to offer a tribute, which was then followed by a sermon given by the presiding bishop, Michael Curry, because you don't want to speak after Michael Curry. (laughs) Now, at a funeral, a tribute is typically stories and remembrances about the departed, while the sermon is meant to present the gospel message of love and hope. But if you've been listening, you know that in this case, remembrances of George and the gospel message of love and hope are not easily separated. George recounted the tale of the Velveteen Rabbit because he believed that sharing God's love makes us real. George recited Euchre's ballpark chant because he knew that the gospel is not fully realized until we get up and get out of here to live it in the world. And George sang us that ridiculous chorus of Chumbawamba on Easter Day because, as his own life would show, Christ's resurrection is reflected in our own capacity. Christ's resurrection is reflected in our own capacity to get knocked down but get up again, renewed over and over by the strength of our risen Lord. George loved the church because he believed that in its fellowship we find our greatest opportunity to unite and change the world around us. And George cherished his family because he knew that in the incarnation of God, in Jesus, we are pointed to this truth, that we know the love of God most keenly through the actual incarnated love of those around us, forgiven in all our human imperfection, but loved and treasured beyond measure. No, in the case of George Council, there is no particular distinction to be made between the tribute and the sermon. For in the message which was his life, 
he proclaimed the gospel. To make this tribute a sermon, then, it remains only to claim on George's behalf and on our own the promise spoken by St. Paul in today's epistle. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. That promise we claim for George and for ourselves. Thank God for George. Thank God for the good shepherd whom he served, for the good shepherd that he was, for the gift of his life, for the grace with which he enjoyed it, and for the generosity with which he shared it. And be assured that nothing, 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 nothing will ever separate him or you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. George is risen with him. Alleluia. Amen.